Hello everyone. Please sit with me in nature around the campfire and listen with me. Listen to the voice of the wind caressing mountains, valleys, canyons, deserts and plains. Listen to the sun and the sky, the moon and the stars, the clouds and the storm. They have stories to tell us tonight. And here is the first story, one about the origins of the Apache people. And it goes like this. There was a time when light did not exist. In the beginning, the world was covered with darkness. There was no sun and no day. The perpetually dark sky had no moon or stars. In this dark world, all manner of beasts and birds prospered. Among the beasts were many hideous monsters that did not even have a name, as well as the ancestors of beasts that still populate our world. Wolves, bears, foxes, and also much smaller beasts like beavers, rabbits, squirrels, rats and mice, and on top of that, all sorts of creeping creatures, of creeping beasts, such as lizards and snakes. There were humans too, but very few, because they could not thrive in this world. The beasts destroyed their offspring, they denied them access to the land. And so humans lived hidden, in fear, in caves that were even darker than the outside. The birds were not as ferocious and dangerous as the beasts, and as more elevated beings, they were organized. They held councils, and they obeyed to their chief, the eagle. In these ancient times, both birds and beasts had the power of speech. And for eons, the world stayed like this. The birds dominated in the dark sky. The beasts dominated on the dark earth. And a few humans survived, living in terror of being found and eaten. But one day, it happened that the birds became curious of what the world would be if there was a light in it. They wanted light admitted, and so they sent an embassy to the beasts to discuss the transformation of the world, the replacement of the darkness with light. The beasts liked the world as it was, and they refused. The agreement of birds and beasts was needed for the light to be invited. And because they could not obtain it by diplomacy, the birds resorted to war. They declared war on the beasts. The beasts were stronger. Some were enormous and apparently invincible and others were tiny, they could hide and attack by surprise. But the eagle armed the birds with bows and arrows, so that they could attack at a distance, and they could also escape flying, or they could drop stones from above to the heads of the biggest beasts. After many days of ferocious and uncertain fight, the birds prevailed. Once the surviving beasts had accepted defeat in this war, this war that saw 
many of them disappear forever. The birds could impose their decision. The light was admitted to the world, and all creatures, the birds, the beasts that had survived, and humans who emerged from their caves, for the first time, they all saw the beauty of nature and marveled at the world they lived in. Mankind could finally live in the open, and it began to prosper. But men did not forget they owed their newfound freedom to the birds, and especially their chief, the eagle. They started wearing his feathers as emblems of wisdom, justice, and power. Among human beings who lived during this era of access to the illuminated world, there was a woman who had had many children, but none of them had survived because they had been taken by the beasts. Mankind could now inhabit the surface, but men remained praise to the remaining wolves, the bears, the serpents, and the most feared of all beasts, the dragon. One day, this woman had another son, and she refused to lose him like she had lost the others. So she dug a deep cave in the ground for him to conceal her baby and she closed the entrance and built a campfire over the spot so that her son would be kept warm and hidden from the beasts especially from the dragon who was very evil but also astute and constantly hungry every day she would remove the fire and descend into the cave to nurse her child. And then she would return to the surface and rebuild the campfire. The dragon was suspicious and always on the hunt for human children. He would frequently come and question her, asking where her children were. The only reason he did not eat her was that she could produce more babies. But the woman was brave, and despite the terror of the dragon, she never revealed the existence of her son, always swearing that she had no more children and that the dragon had already eaten all of them. Thanks to her ruse, the child could grow in his cave for several years. His mother had to let him out sometimes because he needed to play and run. She did it when the dragon was not in sight. And for several more years, her son kept growing, turning from toddler to child to adolescent. But it happened one day that the dragon saw his tracks and this enraged the monster because he could not find the place where the boy was hidden. He threatened to kill the mother if she didn't reveal where her son was. But the woman, again, refused to give up her child. And she decided he would no longer be allowed to go out of his cave, out of fear she would lose him like the others. When she descended into the cave and told her son, the boy refused to stay underground forever, and he said that instead he would go hunting. There was no stopping him. He told his mother that living in hiding and Fred was not leaving, and that, come what may, he would go out into the wilderness and leave, hunt, 
breathe the air, and enjoy the light. She argued that outside there were the wolves, the bears, the serpents, and even worse, the dragon, which was already looking for him. But his decision was made. On the following day, he asked his uncle, one of the few men who populated the earth at the time, to accompany him and give him weapons so that he could hunt. The uncle made a little bow and some arrows for the boy, and the two went hunting. They found the tracks of a deer, and they followed them, in the plain, across a river, in canyons, and finally up a mountain, until they found their prey. The boy took his little bow and shot. This was his first success as a hunter, and they rejoiced. His uncle showed him how to prepare and cook the meat on a fire. But as they were preparing their meal, the huge form of the dragon suddenly appeared. The most feared, the most terrifying of all beasts that never let a prey escape had finally found them. The uncle was petrified. But maybe due to his natural bravery, or his innocence, the boy was not afraid. The dragon could have eaten him on the spot. But instead, after all those years of looking for this particular boy that he had found for the first time, the dragon decided to take its time and enjoy his triumph. The dragon took the meat they were preparing and declared that he would eat the meat and then the boy. But instead of being terrified and uh, beg for his life, as humans usually did, the boy walked to the dragon, took back the meat and uh, declared that this was his and that the dragon would certainly not eat him or his uncle. The dragon was astonished at this bravery or foolishness. He didn't know which one it was. And he thought the boy was probably mad. He retook the meat, but so did the boy. And four times, the piece of meat changed hands. Finally, the boy asked the dragon if he would fight him. The monster laughed and said, yes, in whatever way the little man would like. The dragon was huge and protected by four coats of horn. Nothing would hurt such a monster, so he didn't worry at all that he could be defeated. The boy offered the following dual rules. They would stand at a hundred steps from each other, and the dragon would be allowed to shoot four times at the boy with its enormous bow and arrows. If the boy survived, they would exchange places, and the little man would have four shots at the dragon. The dragon laughed and accepted this little game that he couldn't lose. And then he took his bow, which was made of an entire pine tree, and its quiver of arrows. Each of the arrows was a pine tree sapling, and they were twenty feet long. The dragon took aim, but the boy was small and quick. He could avoid the deadly arrow once, twice, three times, and finally four times. Then the boy said 
it was now his turn to shoot. The dragon was mildly annoyed that the boy was still alive, but the rules were the rules, so they exchanged places. With its four coats of horn, there was no risk at all that a small arrow would even scratch his skin. Hitting the huge dragon was easy, but the boy knew that his little arrows were no match for this huge armored enemy, unless he could shoot just at the right place, near the heart and between the scales. He shot the first arrow that landed exactly where he intended, near the heart, and the dragon's outer coat of horn fell to the ground. Then a second shot destroyed the second coat, and a third also hit its target. The dragon was now trembling, because should the fourth shot hit again, it would pierce his heart, and the tiny human would win. Dragons were evil, but they were still bound by their words, and the monster was now at the boy's mercy. The boy shot for the fourth time, and the arrow pierced the dragon's heart. With a tremendous roar, the dragon rolled down the mountainside, into a canyon below. The order of nature had suddenly changed. A tiny human, with agility and precision, had defeated the most powerful of beasts. Storm clouds swept the mountain, lightning flashed, thunder rolled, and rain poured. The world would never be the same again. The age of humans was beginning. This boy's name was Apache, and he was destined to become the first chief of men. We have more stories coming, and as you know, we are talking about Apache and Navajo mythology tonight. Apart from telling you stories, I will also tell you a little bit about these peoples, or groups of peoples to be more precise, their history, their culture, where they came from. But for now, all you need to do is relax and adopt a comfortable position. This long story is also made to help you fall asleep. And tonight, we have taken place around a campfire. We are in nature. The dark sky is illuminated by more stars than we could count and they all look after us. Everything is perfectly quiet, and you can just focus on my voice. As usual, there are timestamps to navigate between the various stories, and come back where you left if you fall asleep. They are in the first comment pinned under this video together with links to Spotify, Apple Music, and other streaming sites, if you find it more convenient to listen there. And also a link to my Patreon page. You can get all the stories as podcasts on Patreon, with and without background sounds all along. You can download the videos and audios of all my stories and you also get regular posts about what I'm working on, and you also contribute to keep this channel free of ad breaks for everyone, before, during, and after videos. You will not be interrupted by a loud ad at any point tonight, during this story or others, so don't worry about that. 
Now take a deep breath, exhale, and here is another story for you. This one is a creation myth of the Kiowa Apache from the southern plains, and it does not necessarily connect to the first story because it is one of multiple traditions and storylines that exist among Apache bands or tribes. Here is the story of Kuterastan, the creator. His name means one who lives above. In the beginning, before there was earth or sky, and even longer before there were plains, forests, mountains and deserts, and also long before there were winds, rain, rivers and lakes, there was only darkness. Until one moment when, into darkness, appeared a small and thin disk, and inside this disk, a small bearded man, no larger than a frog, Kuterastan, that was his name, could not know it. He was without past. He didn't know even the concept of time. But he was a creative force called into existence to shape the world from his tiny disk. After he awakened and rubbed his eyes, he looked above him into the infinite darkness, and by the powers that he had, the darkness above filled with light and illuminated the darkness below, separating this world into two halves, above and below his disk. Then he rubbed his eyes again and looked to the east. The eastern night took the yellow color of dawn, and after that he looked west. The western night was immediately shaded by the power of his look, with the amber tones of dusk. As he glanced around himself, clouds of different colors appeared. Then again, Uterastan rubbed his eyes and face, and as he flung the sweat from his hands, a very small cloud appeared, with a tiny little girl, even smaller than him, on top of it. Her name was Stenatlia, which means the woman without parents. Guterastan and Stenatlia started talking, and for the first time, Words were spoken in this world that was still just light above, darkness below, yellow light in the east, amber light in the west, and a few clouds around them. The two spoke, puzzled by the question of who they were, where they came from, and wondering what this world was and what was going to happen, unaware that they would be the source of what was going to happen to the world. After thinking for some time, again, Kuterastan rubbed his eyes and face, and then rubbed his hands together. When he opened them, his sweat flew, and two new beings appeared from it. The first was Chuganai, the sun, and the second had Intin skin, meaning pollen boy. The two new entities were as puzzled and ignorant of the primordial energy they embodied as Guterastan and Stenatnia were. The four of them sat a long time in silence on a cloud meditating, 
until Guterastan broke the silence and asked what they should do to make this existence, this world, more habitable and filled with meaning. A purpose was emerging, the creation of a world. The four of them, that humans would one day call God, started this creation by giving birth to more entities. Led by Kuterastan, the four created Naturalecho, the Trenchula, who could weave and help them. Then they made Nokuse, the Big Dipper, who stood next to them, and then the wind and lightning and thunder, each given characteristic tasks that made the world richer, more alive and more wonderful. But however entertaining this creation was, the four still lived on a cloud that they grew bored of. It was a poor home. So they turned their attention to making an earth, the earth, that would be a much more suitable place to inhabit for them, for their creations and uh, the ones to come too. The four gods mixed their sweat in Kuterastan's palms. He rubbed his hands again, and a small brown ball emerged from them. It was no bigger than a bean, but like the tiniest of seeds can give birth to giant trees, this small ball was just the beginning. The gods expanded the ball by kicking in it, and then they let the wind inside it to inflate it. The earth grew bigger and bigger much, much bigger than the gods who had created it. Naturally true, the trenchula attached a black cord to the ball and pulled it far to the east, where the yellow light of dawn shined. Then a blue cord was pulled to the south, a yellow cord to the west, and a white cord to the north. All were pulled to these four points, and the earth expanded again, becoming a vast expanse of smooth brown plains when the Trenchula god was finished. Kuterastan had poles placed at each corner to hold the earth in place, allowing the world to sit still. The gods had begun to sing as they created, and the joy of seeing the world take shape in all the ways they imagined inspired their songs, which in return also shaped the world. The creation also sprang from songs that the gods invented, and each new thing came with a new song. After the earth had been stretched and made to sit still, Kuterastan began another song, referring to the sky. He felt there ought to be one, to embrace the earth, and four times he chanted this new sky song. At the end of the fourth time, he spread his hands wide before him, and the sky appeared, embracing earth in every direction. On earth, the landscape was being shaped by winds, waters running through the plains, by the creativity of the four gods and uh, their offspring, that all contributed to shape this new world with songs and dances. One day, the lightning maker, one of Uterastan's children, returned with three beings that he had found in the sky. 
these were just shapes. Two girls and a boy with the limbs like the gods, but no eyes, ears, hair, mouth, nose or teeth. And though they had arms and legs, they lacked fingers and toes. They were like an unfinished draft, resembling the shape of the gods. Maybe they had accidentally appeared from one of their creation work, or another entity had put them there. This was, is, and will remain a mystery. Enthusiastically, the four gods decided to finish them, which would require a lot of sweat and inspiration. They had a sweat house built on earth, and they closed it with clouds. And when they had enough sweat, the woman without parents, Stenatlia, used it to shape the beings. She made them fingers, toes, mouth, eyes, ears, hair and nose. When she was done, Uterastan welcomed them to creation. The boy was made Sky Boy, chief of the sky and its people. The first girl was made Earth Daughter and placed in charge of the earth and its crops. And the second girl was called Pollen Girl and assigned the care of the health of the earth people. The earth could now be populated and new songs began from all these voices, the first gods and their offspring, who sang, creating all sorts of animals on earth, in the rivers and the lakes, birds in the sky, and in the last creation song, men, their children. These two first creation stories are just two of many more myths and legends that were transmitted for generations within Apache tribes. But who are the Apache? They are not a single people, but a quite large group of different bands and tribes. Not that large by the population, there would be a bit more than a hundred thousand individuals in this group nowadays, but large by the area where they used to live in the southwestern United States, and large by their number of communities of bands and tribes. Chiricahua, Ricaria, Lipan, Mescalero, Salinero, Aravaipa, Pinaleño, and there are more. These are all different tribes that lived and still live from Texas and Oklahoma to Arizona. People from these tribes have also migrated to cities all across the United States, especially in the 20th century, and some live abroad. But this is still where many Apache live, and especially the most connected to their ancestral culture. So why do these different tribes form a larger group? Because they are culturally and historically related. They share the same language group, called the Apachean or Southern Athabascan group. Athabascan is a large family of indigenous languages in North America that extends far beyond the American Southwest. It is also present in Alaska, in the west of Canada, on the Pacific coast of the United States, in Oregon and Northern California, and in the southwest, including in the north of Mexico. It doesn't mean that speakers of these many languages that belong to the Athabascan family can understand each other, 
but the languages they speak have a common origin, possibly a single common ancestor language, and over centuries and centuries of migrations, cultural exchange with other groups, growing distances between speakers, all these languages have formed, and they keep changing when they are still spoken. This is what languages do. It is not known precisely when the Apache populated the American Southwest. Their arrival is estimated sometime between 800 and 500 years ago. Long before they arrived, there were other Native American peoples in the Southwest, some of them with a sedentary lifestyle, who built many villages and left plenty of archaeological remains that could be dated. For example, in a previous story, I told you about Mesa Verde, a dwelling in Colorado left by the ancestral Pueblo culture. But the Apache were mostly nomads, and it is believed that they originated from regions that are now in Canada. This fits with the presence of the same Athabascan language family up north in Canada and as far as Alaska. Actually, this group that would have migrated to the south, reaching regions of plains, deserts and mountains that were very different from the place they came from, this group or this migration wave would have spread over a large region, several American states, and there would have been divergences. Another major cultural group born from the same migration that became a neighbor to the Apache is the Navajo. Culturally, they are distinct enough. Overall, the Navajo adopted a more settled lifestyle, planting crops and practicing herding, whereas more Apache lived a nomadic life. But that was not systematic. The Apache had different types of housing. In the plains, tipis were common, that is to say, conical tents made with wooden poles and animal skins. In the highlands, they built more wikiups or wigwans, which are domed dwellings that are semi-permanent. They could be used for a longer time, and they were not made to be disassembled and transported like tipis. In the desert of northern Mexico, they built hogans, which are earthen structures that are also typical of the Navajo. These regions where they arrived were not empty. They found other peoples there. We don't exactly know what happened then. If they fought, forced others to go, if they mixed, maybe a bit of all this. But by the end of the 16th century, at the latest, possibly before, they were established in this region of the American Southwest, and also in the north of Mexico. They shared this very large space with other peoples, like the Pueblo peoples, that they traded with. Both Apache and Navajo were not affected by the first decades of European colonization in America. They were too far for that. But the first contacts and clashes happened in the 17th century, at the beginning with the Spaniards who came from Mexico, and on a much larger scale in the 19th century with the United States that were expanding to the West at the time. An intermittent war happened between Apache bands and the US Army between 1849 and 1886, almost 40 years. The most famous figure of this conflict is Goya Ache, also known as Geronimo, 
who was a, a leader and a medicine man, that is to say, a healer and spiritual leader. He rose to fame because he participated in many, many raids over more than 30 years against interests and troops of Mexico and the United States. The Apache had been confined to reservations after the United States took possession of this region after the war against Mexico. And these reservations no longer permitted them to live the kind of free-moving lifestyle that was their customary way of life. So, over the years, hundreds of Apache joined Geronimo in breakouts from the reservations to launch raids, not on a very large scale, at any time he was in command of only a few dozen men, but for a long time he tried to keep the flame of independence for the people that had been displaced and forced to live in reservations that were much smaller than the territories they used to live on. He was finally made prisoner in 1886 and he spent the rest of his life as such not in a cell, but under watch, and he died in 1909. His capture in 1886 is generally considered to be the end date of the Apache conflict. After that, the intensity of reds was much less, but still, it is only in the 1920s that the cycle of reds and counter-reds made by and against the Apache, finally ended. Now I told you that the Navajo were cultural cousins of the Apache. They are different cultures and societies, but they settled in the same regions and their languages are parented. They have common roots. There are more than 400,000 Navajo, and they have a creation myth called the Diné Bahane, literally the story of the people. The Navajo call themselves the Diné, the people, and it is extraordinary. So let's explore it. This is the story of the Dineta, the homeland which is where the Navajo live, but not the only world to ever have existed. Our world is actually the fourth and final world, and many things happened before the first men arrived here, many, many generations ago. It all began with the first world, the first world was small and simple. It was entirely black and made of four different seas. And where these seas met, there was a single island where a single pine tree grew. The only inhabitants of this first world were the air spirit people Ants, beetles, dragonflies, locusts and bats. No one ever knew whether this world existed for an eternity or maybe just a heartbeat. But it happened that a cloud formed above each of the four seas. There was a black cloud, a white cloud, a yellow cloud, and a blue cloud, and a wind began to blow. The blue and the yellow cloud came together in the west, and as they mixed, first woman was formed. At the same time, the black and the white cloud came together in the east, and as they mixed, first man appeared. Each of them had appeared with a stone. From the blue and the yellow cloud 
the turquoise had formed, and it was owned by the woman. From the white and black clouds, a crystal had also formed, and it was owned by the man. Using their stones, each of them made a fire in their respective corner of this small, dark world. And for the first time, light appeared. This light was the awakening of the mind. For the first time in this dark world, thoughts and feelings came into existence. As the clouds rose higher in the sky, first man and first woman saw each other's fires in the distance. They were intrigued, and they searched for each other, guided by the light, and they met. They decided to stay together in this world, where everything complemented something else. But this harmony didn't last. Another being, Great Coyote, formed in the water of the four seas, and appeared near them. He declared that he knew everything, everything that was under the water and in the sky, and that he owned knowledge. And yet a fourth being soon appeared, another coyote named First Angry, who declared he was older than the other three, and knew witchcraft. The four of them began to argue, bringing disharmony into the world, and like a plague, disharmony extended to the air spirit people, the ants, the beetles, the fireflies, the locusts, and the bats. They also became jealous of each other and began to fight. The island at the center of the four seas had turned to chaos and war. The spirits of the four seas could stand it no more and demanded all these beings to leave their world. There was an opening in the sky, in the east, and flying or climbing, all the inhabitants of the first world escaped. They crawled through the passage in the sky and left the first world, the dark world, forever. The insects, the man, the woman, and the two coyotes entered the second world. The second world was as blue as the first was dark. The newcomers began to explore it, and they found blue plains, blue rivers, and blue mountains. And finally they found inhabitants. There were blue birds, blue hawks, blue jays, and many blue furry animals. But the masters of the second world were the swallow people, all birds who welcomed the newcomers to share their world, where harmony ruled. It was decided that air spirit people and swallow people would live together as a single tribe, and first man, first woman and the two coyotes were also allowed to stay with them. For 23 days, they all lived together and treated each other as members of the same tribe. But on the 24th day, one of the air spirit people approached the wife of the Swallow people's chief and asked to sleep with her. The wife accepted, and on the following day, her husband found out. He complained that the foreigners had been treated as equals, and with kindness, but had been ungrateful and treacherous. Even though they had been given a second chance, these air spirit people were still not living in balance and harmony, and so they had to leave this world. 
Like in the first world, sides appeared, fights ensued, and the offended swallow chief demanded all that did not belong to this world to leave it. There was an opening in the sky to the south, and the air spirit people, the man, the woman, the coyotes and the blue beings who disagreed passed through it. They went to the third world. The third world was as yellow as the second world was blue. The third world teemed with life. There were animals they had never seen before, like antelopes, deers, turkeys and squirrels. It also had two rivers that crossed in its center and in its corners were sacred mountains. In the east was the white Dawn Mountain, in the south the blue turquoise mountain, and there were also a yellow and a black mountain. On these mountains lived four holy people who were immortal, one on each mountain. The third world was welcoming, and the refugees from the first and the second world settled there, happy for this new opportunity to begin a new life. First man and first woman built a hut and settled near the place where the rivers crossed. The four holy people tolerated the newcomers into their world, and one day they visited the man and the woman. They asked them to cleanse themselves, because they would soon return. The two obeyed and bathed carefully. When the holy people returned, they performed a ritual that transformed first man and first woman. Until then, they had been spirit people, who were born from nature in the first world. They were an essence, a potential, that had not yet taken material shape. The ritual transformed them into human beings with great powers. The holy people instructed them to now live as husband and wife, to explore their new flesh and reproduce. And they did. The man and the woman had several pairs of twins, and time passed in the third world. They learned weaving from two creatures that also lived near the crossing of the rivers, Spider-Woman and Spider-Man. Their children, and then their children's children, formed a village where they all lived in balance and harmony. Until one day, when first woman complained that while men went hunting or making tools, women did all the work. They gathered the food and tended to the fields. They could live without men for sure. First man grew hungry and called all the other men. He told them that the women thought they could live without them, and that it was time to show them they would be miserable without men. And so the men decided to go live on the other side of the river. With everything they had invented and made, the axes, the hoes, for four years, Men and women lived separated and increasingly unhappy. Each side survived, but they had less food, more work to do. The men lacked new clothes, the women lacked meat, and they all longed for each other. A reconciliation finally happened between first man and first woman 
and the two sides reunited. All women had crossed on a raft, all but a mother and her two daughters. When they tried to cross swimming, the spirit of the river captured them and took them to his house under the waters, where they would keep company to his own children. The humans soon realized that the two girls were missing, and they began to look for them. After a long search, which gave no results, they concluded that these girls had to be kept prisoner under the river, and so they swam there to retrieve them. Under the waters, they found the house of the spirit of the river and the girls inside. But they were accompanied by First Angry, the coyote, who had introduced anger and witchcraft to the world. First Angry took the children of the spirit of the river with him, stealing them. The men didn't know that, and they began celebrating because the lost girls were returned. But on the following day, when they all woke up, they saw all sorts of animals running in panic in every direction. The black insects and bats from the first world, the blue birds and furry animals of the second world, and the antelopes, the deers or the squirrels from the third world. They announced that a wall of water was coming from all corners of the world, the wrath of the river spirit would soon submerge the yellow world under a flood. They all ran to the mountains where lived the holy people to ask for help. One of them, Turquoise Boy, on the Blue Mountain, gave First Man a reed and told him to plant it. So it was done. The reed was planted on the top of the mountain, and it grew quickly to the sky, where there was an opening. All people from the three worlds, the humans and the holy people, they all climbed to escape the tide that would soon submerge everything. And they arrived in the fourth world, the white world. The refugees had arrived in the middle of a lake, in a world populated by beasts. But they arrived to this world with all the experience and knowledge they had acquired in the previous world. It was decided that this new world would be shaped by the holy people and first man and first woman. They would recreate the mountains from the third world with soil, and they would add the colors they had known along their journey. In this world, they would also add the sun, the moon, the stars, and the seasons, modeling the white world into the world we know today. But it was not only wisdom and balance they had brought with them. First Hungry, the coyote, had crossed to the fourth world too, and they ran into problems because of him. First Hungry resented the men and the holy people for not including him into their plans, and so with the jealous and chaotic nature that he was born with, he tried to derail their plans. The truth is that no one trusted him, and so he was not informed of their projects for the world, and this is the reason why he decided to ruin them as much as he could. When the patterns of the sun, the moon, the night, the day and the seasons had been designed, they were perfectly harmonious. Day and night would mark the time for work, 
life, rest and sleep. The seasons would permit to know when to plant food and harvest. And the harmony of celestial bodies would help keep harmony like a mirror between beings in the world. The coyote could not destroy all this creation, but he could spoil it. He disrupted the paths of the sun and the paths of the moon, so that instead of being synchronized, the twelve months of the sun would be thirteen months of the moon. He disrupted the seasons, so that sometimes frost would come early and sometimes remain late. Sometimes the rains would come, sometimes not, and all the creatures of the world would be at the mercy of whimsical weather. There would never be absolute peace, certainty and harmony in human lives. Their harvest would never be guaranteed. Coyote was also responsible for the fact that true death came into existence in the world. One day, he threw a stone into a lake and declared that if it sank, then the dead would go back to the previous world and never exist again in our world. Of course the stone sank and death became the fate of every living being. The people were mad at him for what he had done, and they went to find him with the intention to beat him. But he spoke and said that he had actually saved the world, because it would soon have been overpopulated and unlivable if no one ever disappeared. It was only fair that generations would not exist all at the same time. The people had to admit that there was some wisdom in this, and they understood that the world could not be just a fixed and perfectly still harmony, otherwise there could be no life. Instability, unpredictability, and even death were maybe part of a greater balance and of this greater balance that made our world first angry the coyote that some would be inclined to call evil or chaos was maybe a necessary part. Once humanity and the creatures from all the four worlds that had all arrived in the fourth world had settled. The time when history would begin had arrived. It was not the end of wonders or heroes. There would be monsters to slay, new extraordinary creatures to see the light of day. There would be times of exile, cold, poverty and hunger. The history of the Navajo the history of the people was ready to begin. We have reached the end of our journey for tonight, and I will now let you enjoy the sound for a little while to lull you to sleep. The night is still young, and you can keep your eyes closed dreaming of the countless stories the stars above us have seen and heard since the dawn of times. Sleep well, sweet dreams, au revoir.